Following on from what Mary says, uh, rather than Dennis stand up and give a, a lecture for 40 minutes, we've decided to do it by way of interview. But hopefully, towards the end, we'll have a short uh, Q and A session, uh, if time permits. So, Dennis, welcome to Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Welcome Gary. to Belfast. Thank you. Thank uh, you very I, much. For I the know of, of necessity you've been globe trotting these past few years, but during that time, have you managed to keep an eye on the progress we've been making here in Northern Ireland? And are you impressed? Quite definitely. Uh, I, you know, I think you know when you look what's happening here. There seems to be a huge surge of entrepreneurship here. If you look at the number of entrepreneurs that have won the overall Entrepreneur of the Year in the categories as well, which is the Ernst & Young competition, uh, there is a real pipeline of exciting and scalable businesses. And I, I suppose the thing that I would love to see is that more uh, companies here don't sell out that you know, when an entrepreneur hits a level where his business is worth or her business is worth 10 or 15 million pounds, that they actually keep going and that they actually have a belief in turning it into a multinational like Galen or Foil Meats or you know, some of the other major companies here. So it, it's all about everybody here, you know, particularly in the accountancy profession, when they're ha holding the hands of their clients, is push them forward and believe in themselves. and. You know, it's the same problem in the Republic, where a lot of our technology companies that are homespun have been sold too early, and the entrepreneur didn't have that push and belief in themselves. But is it not hugely difficult to move it on to a global platform? Not really, because, um, you know, if you look at the companies here that have been floated, uh, they may be very successful for investors. Uh, there's a growing recognition, particularly in Wall Street, you know, that Irish companies are really serious about what they do. Uh, and uh, I don't think capital is the, is the hold back. Y yes, we all have these kind of problems in every business where our bank is holding us back because we have enough working capital. But, you know, in terms of equity going forward, I think there's real opportunity for, you know, companies to go to Wall Street when they hit a particular size and actually go the full distance. I, I want to explore all that yeah. uh, through, throughout the morning, but I also want to, to find out a little more, bit more about Dennis O'Brien, where he started, where he arrived at, and, and, and where he's going to. If, I wonder if, if I went back today to your old teachers in Rathgar, or to your old university lectures at UCD, uh, will they be surprised at just how successful Dennis O'Brien is? I'd say I wasn't very memorable, to be honest with you, uh, for a lot of my teachers, uh, particularly in university. Um, I, look, you know, when you look at a class of people, you know, sometimes, you know, people, if they're good at academics, everybody says they're going to be a brilliant success. 
uh, I generally have a view the messers sometimes you know eke out a, a better living at the end of the day uh, and there's kind of a halfway house as well and maybe I wasn't in that category even um, so I think you know when I look at children or young, young kids and that I you can never really say who's going to be great it's not like a soccer player where you know you can see them run around with a ball and they're going to be brilliant but, you know, people in all, you know, diff takes different walks of life and they can be brilliant in their sector. And, you know, I don't think you can judge people by the money they make. It's, be, it's about what they do, you know, whether they're an artist or a musician, you know, whether they're a sports person, it really doesn't matter, provided they, to the absolute ability, push yeah. themselves. So academically, you have no great interest academically? I, no, I was just brutal, to be honest with you. Were you? Yeah. <laughs> I, you, I, I, was, wasn't there one exam you had, you had a particular problem with? Uh, mathematics. Mathematics, yeah. How, how many times did you sit that examination? I did the Leaving Cert uh, three times, and the third time I got a D in past maths. Well done, congratulations. Thank you very much. I felt pretty good. I was in my first year in UCD when I actually got past maths in the Leaving Cert. Uh, it was a world record. Uh, but there again, you know, people say, oh, well, you need maths to do business. And I remember you couldn't get into commerce, so I did an arts degree, and I studied history and politics. But, you know, if you can count to 10, I mean, most people won't admit it, you can do business. You know, and I'm actually not bad on numbers. I've kind of grown to understand numbers. But, you know, uh, you know, Pythagoras and all that nonsense doesn't do a lot if you're going to want to run a business. Now, that's probably sacrilege to the educationists here, here yeah, and I apologise, but <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, you, you and your three siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you enjoyed a fairly middle class upbringing in, in yep. Dublin. Can you tell me a little bit about the family, about mum and dad? Well, my father um, worked for a company that got caught in the oil recession in 73, and he was a 5% shareholder in a business making aerosols and also producing pharmaceuticals in uh, Tala outside Dublin. And uh, the business went into receivership. And my father then set up his own business, which was a, or a veterinary pharmaceutical business with products for horses. So I can actually remember, you know, my father, first of all, taking all his savings and putting it into the business. But then every day I would talk to him about his business. And he would give me a lift to school because it was on his way to his factory. And he would explain to me, you know, people weren't paying him, a customer let him down, something happened in the factory. The bank was giving him grief. Uh, you know, all these things he used to relate to me as a sort of a 10, 11 year old. Uh, and, you know, it gave me a kind of private business education. You're absorbing all that. Right? I absorbed it all. And then, you know, I get home at night. He'd come home, he'd change, I'd listen to him. What happened that day? And it, it was just a lesson. So, you know, I, I, I could see the stress that he was under, you know, setting up a business and having a small business. And, you know, it has been, that was a great grounding from a very yeah. early stage and was a big advantage. And did you get the work ethic from him, do you, do you think? Yeah, he, he, my father is a demon worker. He still works, he's 83, uh, still travels with his business. But he, the best thing he taught me how to do was sell. And I remember going on a sales call with him one day, and I, as a sort of a teenager, I had my hands in my pockets, and he let a rip at me. He says, get those hands out of your pockets you know and he made me do the sales pitch uh, and so he taught me how to sell and I think you know if you can count to 10 and you can sell uh, you can be an entrepreneur hope you're writing all this down are you <laughs> count to tell and sell. sounds very simplistic I sound like an American evangelist <laughs> but uh. Uh, tell me about your your, your mum my mother uh, f was from Tandra Gee, and I suppose I got Good a bit... Ulster of, woman, yeah? Yeah. Her father was a cattle dealer. Um, they were comfortable. She went to Trinity, met my father. Um, she was uh, a Church of uh, Ireland. My father was Catholic. Nobody on either side went to the wedding. It was uh, just a, one of those periods <laughs> that you can't relate to in modern times. And uh, so they had a kind of hard beginning. And my mother became unwell. They were supposed to emigrate to Canada, didn't, and they stayed in Ireland. Did it ever impact on you, the mother and father being two different religions? No. Really. Even growing up, no? No, never. not in the least bit. You know, I went, I went to the high school, which was really a Church of Ireland school. Uh, I think it was a terrific school, fantastic school. 
and you know not really it's not you know when you look back it was probably a big deal but as a child you wouldn't probably think about it yeah, yeah. and uh, I remember smuggling we my mother was an Olympic smuggler <laughs> and she used to smuggle ham and turkeys and everything down from uh, Trandagui to Dublin and you know it was part of the fun of growing up you know it was a sport going through the border with everything under and you know sitting on everything in the back of the car would, would you have been a, would you have been a, a regular visitor to Tandrigee oh yeah up? no we'd be going up there every couple of weeks so onto really? the farm this summer we'd spend a lot of time on the farm um, and my grandmother was a hell, a hell of a businesswoman and she ended up having a, a, an egg farm she you know had like thousands of chickens and uh, which just you know it was fantastic growing up in the countryside. I think, you know, the four by four kids nowadays don't understand the countryside, yeah. and generally I employ more people from the country than city slickers, and you know, why is that? Why? Why do you because you know they come the hard way, and you know nowadays you know if you're a child in Belfast going to a nice school, your mother and father's driving you, chauffeur driving you all around the place, to, to rugby matches or whatever at the weekend, that's all soft living. If you saw somebody who's come off a farm and has done physical labour, you know, you bring them into a business environment and nothing's going to rumble them. That's right. So I, I, that, that and nurses, because nurses can multitask. Some of the best managers we've ever had were nurses uh, who moved out of medicine and into business. So, you know, culchies and nurses. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. If uh, if your father give you your your work ethic, your mother give you your sort of conscience. She was a, she was a great human rights. Yeah, uh, she was. You know, t she's interesting in that regard. She is a Guardian reader. She doesn't listen to RTE. Doesn't read any Irish Southern Irish newspapers. Uh, <laughs> Good ultra Protestant here. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> she listens to Radio Four all day. And. You know, she is very interested in what's happening in the developing world. She's a serial protester, particularly outside the U.S. Embassy. She had a real affinity to... She used to take you on the protest. She used to bring me to the protest. And I remember the day, you know, I sold ESAT, which was the first business I ever sold. She rang me and she said, enough of that nonsense. She says, get into the car. You're coming up to the Russian Embassy to protest against what they're doing in Chechnya. <laughs> so my father and I, like two, you know, <laughs> squirrels got into the car. And we were ended up protesting That's outside the embassy. <laughs> we then went on the lash that night afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm right in thinking, therefore, that when you were left CD, you really had no plan in mind as to what the young Dennis O'Brien would like to do or want to be. I had a kind of half plan. You know, everybody has, you know, well, it's very immature, you know, at 20 or 21, you have a plan that you want to make loads of money and you want to sit in the south of France on a boat with lots of lovely friends beautiful looking friends Been there, it's a very vacuous yeah. it's kind of vacuous is it really? yeah it is uh, you know, I know. I, in life <laughs> in life you never had those thoughts no I've had the thoughts <laughs> <laughs> you're not admitting it Jerry uh, but you know it's pretty vacuous and anyway you know everybody you change as you get older you know and actually what you want to achieve and what you want what you think happiness is going to bring you but money was a driving factor in those days right? it was yeah it, I, I've got to be honest because um my first business was uh, not a success, so you know I had bought a house for 170,000 in Dublin. What year was this? Then? This is 1989, and I uh, had a shopping channel on Sky for six hours with, in conjunction with Grattan, who's a mail order company. Yeah. We'd go in and make a program every morning selling stuff, and it turned out to be, uh, you know, a really bad bad idea because maybe we, we could tease yeah. this out because this was your first business venture first business and a, a massive failure brutal failure brutal failure well I brought in Grattan I brought a lot of very big companies in Ireland like James Crean Smurfit Group in as shareholders uh, I owned about 10% and we said look sh home shopping television shopping is big in the US it's going to happen in Europe the only difficulty was that when Murdoch was starting Sky, he had a very limited audience. It was only when he got the football in that it suddenly became, you know, an homogenous, a massive big business with, you know, maybe 12 million homes in the UK. So at the time, he had about 700,000 homes, and we were depending on that. And in our first month, we had revenues of 14,000, and we lost a half a million. 
Now, I didn't need Fergal to tell me that was a bad <laughs> result. Uh, but, you know, it just was... And then we, we, we brought the overhead down and we did everything. I flew to California, hired this woman on the spot because I saw, a pro, I saw a program in the US that was really successful. I just went, who's the producer of this? I hired her for 12 grand a month, brought her back to London, and we began to get a bit of shape on it. But we ran out of runway. Like, you know, uh, the biggest things about entrepreneurs is, you know, their business either goes, climbs slowly or goes vertical. But if you run out of money, you know, and that's what happened. You, so you got this idea because you, you, you did a master's at Boston. Yeah. Uh, and then you worked for your father out in America. Yeah, I worked for my father. I worked for Tony Ryan first. Right. And he kind of showed me how big businesses work and how do you create a kind of a global business, which he had set up in Shannon and they went to dominate the aircraft leasing business. And he kind of taught me a lot about management, hiring great people and building teams. Um, so I got a bit out of him. And then I saw this idea in the States, and I said, this is going to happen in Europe. But you were five, six years to your early. Probably five or six years now. There's maybe 15 shopping channels yeah. on, on Sky. It's a huge business. And basically, like, we had a deficit at the end. Like, it was pretty bad, about one and a half million, but most of it was Sky, and they could kind of afford that. Um, and I was out of a job. So I was on about 60 grand a year, which is a lot of money in 19... 89 so I had bought this house and then suddenly I was on a zero but luckily I had saved about 10 grand and the luckiest thing was I actually got a radio license at the same time yes, yes. and that kind of saved the day but I mean you, the, the shopping channel had failed you then looked towards the radio, radio because they were looking radio for business, national yeah, radio business yeah. you didn't get that no we didn't no we got voted out I, we, by one vote we didn't get that and then we went for a local because license. Because there was a bit of jiggery pokery going on in the, in the government at that stage, wasn't there, with a certain uh, minister there was, and a certain company? Yeah, there was. There was a bit of jiggery poke. But, you know, maybe we didn't deserve, deserve to admit. I'm never a bad loser in this situation. Like, I've gone for licenses all over the world, and, I, you know, if we lose a license, I lose no Yeah, but speed. this was the first one. This was it was, yeah, and we put everything into it. But then we got a license for Dublin, which turned out to be a better business proposition. And so at that stage, I had about 10% of it. And after about a year, my investors got their money back that they lost in the shopping channel. These were the shopping channel yeah. investors still went into the radio. Yeah. yeah. And um, Anglo-Irish Bank basically lent me 600000 to buy them all out in 1990. And... Um, they got me going to be I mean Anglo Irish Bank everybody's on top of them and, and they're routing it saying it's a disgrace and that but they did a lot of good things they backed a lot of people early on yeah. and uh, they were extremely believing in me how did you go about getting investors in the first place for the shopping channel well um, I just you know flew to I, I had this guy plagued over in the finance director of Grattans which is now owned by Next so every Monday morning I'd head to Leeds uh, and Bradford, where, where they had their headquarters, and I'd go in and talk to him about it, and he'd say, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. And then, basically, at the end, I was running out of money. We were down to about five or six grand in the bank at that stage because I'd raised seed capital. And I, my chairman said to me, like, you have a week to get the deal, and if you don't get the deal, like, we're shutting it, and you're out. And I got the deal. And... Uh, I arrived over to see the guy, and his secretary came down. He says, he's, not, he's too busy to see you. And I said, look, I'm here for the day. I'll see him when I see him, So I, when he's available. So eventually I got up to see him, and I said, I'm going to play one last card. And that is, I said to him, I said, what happens if your competitors do this and you don't do it? And it's a major success. And retailing, I mean, there was no mention of the internet, uh, but they had lots of other competitors. And he said, give me a minute. And I thought he was going to throw me out. And he went off and he talked to the CEO and came back and he says, I'll do the deal. I'm in. So I said, look, my guy, my board won't believe me unless you write a down payment. So he gave me a check for 40 grand. And I went back to the airport in uh, the CEO's Bentley. Uh, so, having arrived in a Nissan ta taxi, uh, and I went back and I went into Paul Power, my chairman, I handed the cheque to him, and he says, or he let off an expletive, and we kind of jumped for joy. He wasn't a drinker, either was I, so we didn't really celebrate in that context, but we, that started us. What happened between being the master at university 
And this man walking him to the CEO with a check. Well, you see, when I was in New York, I always had a job. I always had a job at a painting contracting business when I was in UCD because you only had to do 10 years or 10 uh, hours of study or what not uh, lectures. lectures I even forgot the word um, <laughs> uh, a week a week which which we like was like god like that's a holiday camp and uh, so I would at night time work you know I'd go off at maybe three in the afternoon and work maybe to one in the morning painting houses offices in particular offices were a speciality because you get a, a premium price and they wanted speed and no you know and in the, in the night time done overnight Fantastic. We used to get 300 quid a room. Really? I have a Georgian house. You know, that would be two coats and, you know, two coats of steam, two coats of the, the, uh, the walls and maybe a bit of primer and two coats on the doors. And you'd be out maybe taking maybe 12 hours to 10, 10 hours to do that of a big yeah, room. Yeah, they're, they're cutting in and all. Yeah. very difficult, isn't it? I, I, very difficult. Yeah, well. I still love painting. <laughs> I sometimes grab the brush when I see a fellow coming in to paint the house <laughs> and do a line. Right, there we are. You have your radio station. Uh, mm. Classic, yeah. Classic 90 yeah, yeah, FM, FM, yeah. the, the classic hits. Yeah. Uh, and it worked almost immediately, didn't it? Yeah, we made money after three months. But we, we what we did was we bought all second-hand furniture, second-hand equipment. You know, listeners don't go and visit radio Did you sessions. buy stuff from Century Radio that we, won when the they franchise? W- when they went wallop, we bought their equipment and moved it to the Czech Republic, which was our first market outside Ireland. We bought it for 100 grand. We saved about 500 grand in capex on that. And I always see, when I look at businesses, the, the dingier the offices and the less they spend on beautiful surroundings, the more successful the business is. And, we, you know, straight away, three months to start making money. And we, we did a lot of research. Nobody did research in those days. And it took off like a weed. And I was able to pay down Anglo-Irish Bank after two or three years. And then in the meantime, we saw the wall coming down, went into the Czech Republic and set up a business there and then we spawned and bought other businesses around Europe. We have about six countries uh, from Hungary all the way up to Estonia, Latvia, Finland and and the Czech Republic. So, you know, it was my first real, real business. Had you had you interest in radio or just the business? Business. Like I couldn't tell you know, I could listen, if somebody played a Coldplay song for me, I know it's Coldplay or U two that I love. But forget it. I mean, I'm you know, the people always pull the piss out of me and say, oh, who's that song, Dennis? You know what I mean? I could be a Tina Turner and I wouldn't even know. So I don't have an ear, but I, an ear, I don't know who the songs are, but I have an ear to know what's really good radio, upbeat radio. So even uh, at the weekends, if I'm listening to 98 FM and they come out of the news with a slow song, I ring the program director on Monday and say, you know, at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, you start out of the news with a slow song, you put people to sleep, you need something to lift them. You've also been accused of ringing the news editor on a Monday morning and saying, such and such didn't appear on a Monday morning. You know something, that's kind of a bit of urban myth, because I wouldn't have the time to read. You know, radio is 24-hour business, and newspaper is different, I think. Well, you've got rid of Sammy Smith. Uh, Well... We didn't really. Sammy Smith just ran out of steam because he was there for 14 years and ratings were going south by about 30%. That's the only reason he lost his job. And, you know. Nothing to do with what he wrote in the Sunday. No, no, listen, you know, he was there. Look, he was working for Today FM for five years and I owned it for five years. If I was going to get rid of him, I would have got rid of him the day one. But, you know, that was twisted and turned and turned into an agenda item about political or, you know, sorry, editorial interference. And that's just totally untrue. And in fact, he, you know, went on the radio on his second last program and criticized me from the rooftops. Probably another owner would have pulled the plug. I said, no, let him away with it. You know, it's free speech and I'm not going to, you know, fall for that trap. Let him do it. Eamon Dunphy, another character. I feel sorry for him because he's kind of disturbed. <laughs> and, um, you know, you know, if I came in here and I slagged off everybody and said everybody was brutal and every business was brutal, he, he, she's terrible, everybody, and that's, I, make a, I make a living out of that, I think it's a very unhappy existence. And um, he, you know, he left News Talk because he was just greedy he wanted more and more money all the time and we said no we're not going to do that and your program is not going that well because you keep on bringing the same people on the on the program so um you know our the ceo of news talk made that decision not me i mean i 
people think that I'm into that detail. I, yeah. How in the name of God? Because I could be in Fiji. Well, that's what and I I'm wonder, not thinking yeah. about Eamon yeah. Dunphy at yeah. the time. I'm thinking about my business in Fiji. Yeah. You know, so I, is, is there a court case with you and Dunphy? Um, well, Dunphy, you know, basically uh, libeled me on about 10 counts. <coughs> And you know, I, I've kind of taken. The, I used to, you know, take all this nonsense with the rolls and the punches. And then I said, "This is just too prevalent." You know, if somebody says that Jerry Kelly beats his wife, uh, you know, or you know, it does something, you know, that is totally illegal, you have to say, "Well, I'm not going to take that." And Dunphy just went over the line, and it was pretty silly of him, because I think you know he probably regrets doing it. Yeah. He was on the Late Late Friday, he described Ireland as a, a dump and a kip. Yeah, yeah, I just, you know, look. How do you describe Ireland today? I think, you know, I think we've been probably, for the first time in our history, being totally honest with ourselves. We've looked in the mirror and said, whew, Jesus, are we in bad shape? And we've done things that we should never have done. You know, the whole money supply in Ireland in the la up until 2007, we, you know, it was just a gusher of money and anybody could borrow. And, you know, totally no oversight from the central bank or the financial regulator. Everybody went mad, mad borrowing money. Now, you know, the, the Taoiseach said that last week at Davos. I actually agree with him. And you know we, you know, when you make a mistake, you have to live with yourself and up, face up to the problem not duck and weave, which has been a tradition in the Republic of Ireland, but to actually say to ourselves, we have made a mistake. And I think now that we have, you know, shrunk the size of the government, have had very difficult pay cuts on people, which has been very, very difficult to swallow for the wider population, and restructured our economy, we're the only people who've done that in Europe. The Greeks haven't done it, they're flapping around day in, day out. The Spanish haven't done it, the Portuguese have definitely not done it. And, you know, there is, if you talk to people in Asia, Asia says, you know, leading Asian business people say, gee, Europe is bankrupt, you know, both ba financially but also morally, because there's no leadership, there's no facing up to your problems. And, you know, the, you know, the IMF should be actually running Spain, Portugal, and probably, you know, uh, part, you know, part of the French economy as well. So unless, you know, all these countries, you know, we, what we had was we had money supply, like to beat the band, but no regulation. And I think all these independent central banks just was ridiculous. So now you have a situation where the French, the German, and the Spanish banks can go to the ECB and say, these are our crap loans, give me 100% money on them, even though they're probably worth 30 cents in the euro, and we'll finance it 100% back to you, and we'll smooth it out over five or six years. Contrast that to what's happened with the four pillar banks in the Republic of Ireland, where we've actually said, hey, we've lost 40 or 50 billion. Um, I think that's a better way of fixing the problem than having, living a lie and, you know, just trying to smooth things out and not recapitalising the banks of Europe. So you, you still have confidence, because I read recently that you, you said that you would now invest back in the Bank of Ireland. Uh, did, quite definitely, yeah, definitely. And Why have we? Because I think, you know, the Bank of Ireland has actually sorted out their balance sheet issues. They still have some loans, obviously, to write off. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they've taken in about four and a half billion new capital, and they've cleaned themselves up. They've got rid of stuff into NAMA. And it's cleaned up. Ulster, or sorry, um, AIB is on its way to doing that. If you take RBS, they're on the way to doing that. It's cost about forty-five billion. Um, so I think there's a time to go back in. Uh, the share price was thirteen cents yesterday, um, and I think they will. They will be the bank that will emerge strongest out of this whole maelstrom. You're talking about coming back in. What does Dennis O'Brien do for Ireland now? Well, I'm, I'm, every business I have in, in the Republic of Ireland, I'm investing heavily in it. Uh, in the, uh, we have an online business. We have um, radio businesses. We have uh, food. We have you know, cafes. We have different businesses, yeah. so I'm plowing money into them because yeah. I think there's an opportunity now that leases are less expensive, rents are so to expand them. Um, I have taken... A significant amount of money and deposited it in Irish banks because you can't, you know, you can't 
talk up Ireland without actually doing in practice. So we put a lot of deposits with Irish banks. Um, and, you know, if I'm asked questions, uh, you know, in, in the US on Bloomberg or whatever, I, I will give a very frank assessment of Ireland, but I'll point out where we are in a positive sense as well. But you're a tax exile. <laughs> I'm actually not a tax exile because, you know, my sister moved to London in 1991, say, okay. She's every bit as a tax exile as I am because I moved out of Ireland before I sold my business. And uh, this tax exile thing is nonsense because all my businesses that generate a dividend or a salary or a fees to me or whatever, I pay all my local taxes in Ireland. So I would be a significant taxpayer in the Republic of Ireland. So I don't live in Ireland, okay? So I'm not a tax exile. I mean, but well, why don't you live in Ireland? Because all my businesses are outside of Ireland of a scale nature. So a business in China in online that we're, we're developing. And then I have my mobile businesses out in the Pacific and Central America in about 30 countries in the Caribbean. So you know when i leave ireland i go off to work basically and it's like you going off to produce uh, or to do a show in new york work for one of the television networks there um and you get paid in new york you pay your taxes in new york and you pay your taxes in ireland if yeah. you repatriate your money or if you do whatever you, you know the work that you're doing here you pay your taxes so the notion that i don't pay any taxes is absolutely ridiculous it's totally wrong it's one of the things that when you when you mention Dennis O'Brien, hmm. people who don't know you and haven't been following that closely, they yeah. think of tax exile. Yeah, you tell me you're yeah. not. Yeah, and they also think of the Moriarty Tribunal. Can yeah. we talk a little bit about it for a while? How long have you got? <laughs> as long as you would like to talk about it, because um, again, it's it's perceived that Dennis O'Brien was involved, and all his success is based on something underhand back in the nineties. Well, um, the, I can give you the counter to that. The counter is this, you know, we, we set up a fixed-line phone company to compete with Aircom in 1991. And we raised about a billion euros for that business. And in 1995, we then applied for the mobile phone license. That license was actually given, supposed to be given to another company. And there was a change in government. And there was a coalition government who came in. And they brought an independent consultant in to assess the bids. We put in our bid, it was the best bid, and the consultant who read our bid said, of the 120 bids I have scored around the world in mobile phone licenses, this is the best we've ever seen. We did all the advertising, the branding, we got all the planning permissions for the sites, etc. So we won. We beat a company called Motorola, they couldn't believe it because they employed a thousand people down in Waterford, and they said, hey, Stuart's inquiry, how could this guy beat us in a bid? But I had a partner called Telenor, which is a well-capitalized Norwegian phone company owned by the government. And we won because we won. We had the best bid. And in all the scoring, they had rounds of scoring going on for three months. We were ahead every time. So it wasn't a matter of, matter of being third or second and being lifted up. And so anyway, Moriarty then set up a tribunal, was set up a, to look at Hockey and Larry, because Larry had a relationship with Ben Dunn. Anyway, there's nobody who went into the tribunal who said there's a smoking gun here, that we should not have won it. And in the end, the tribunal's lead counsel was the senior counsel that advised Motorola on why they lost, and they were going to take an action. So you go into a tribunal, you expect everything to be fair and easy, and you've got the referee and the opposing team tied inexplicably linked together. So. They ignored, Moriarty wiped out all the evidence of the independent assessor who did not, you know, have any, you know, he was a totally independent uh, professor from Denmark. And he just ignored all the evidence of people who came in and said, hey, this is not what happened. And uh, by way of example, I was supposed to have given Michael Larry a benefit of 250000 by doing a bank guarantee in Investec in Dublin. The CEO of the bank came in and said, we don't have a guarantee from Dennis O'Brien. We don't have it in writing. We don't have it in written form. But Murray Arty w- wiped out the four or five witnesses from an investment and said, no, Dennis O'Brien gave him a benefit of 250000 I spent about 10, 11 million defending myself. I could afford it. But 
well, the lawyers, the barristers were all getting three grand a day. There was one barrister, all he did was photocopy. He was on two grand a day. They just kept this thing going, okay? And now there's going to be a row about costs. Because when you get like five or six letters from the tribunal, they had armies of lawyers firing stuff at you. I opened up every bank account. They wrote to every bank in the world and said, Dennis O'Brien has given us a right to look at my bank accounts. They could not actually, nobody found any money that went to Michael Lowry. So, you know, in my mind, I fought it vociferously. The report is defective. Like people from the Supreme Court have said it's defective. So there's no more I can do. Why, why not just let it go? It's, it's, it annoys you so much. There's almost anger in your voice even talking uh, about it. Yeah. It's v look, when you're accused of something and you know that it's not true, that you want something on ability, and it actually was a slur on the people who worked with me. You know, the 40 people who worked on the bid, it was a slur. Like, we spent two million on our bid in 1995. So I, I just said, no, I'm not taking it. I don't mind if somebody says, yeah, you did something wrong, and I'll admit I did something wrong. But when you didn't, you've got to fight it. Has it impacted on your professional life? No. no not not at whatsoever. All. Not at all. Uh, look, you know, when, I, when I went to 10 years of the tribunal, and every day I deal with the tribunal, like I had five or six people full time on this. And so that would be wearing. But, you know, I drove myself even further business wise to prove that it just wasn't a lucky piece of decision making that I won that license, that I could replicate it and make it even better build a bigger scale business around the world with a team of people who really all were go a lot of the team of people that built Digicel to what it is all came out of ESAT so you know the guy who runs our Pacific business worked with me in 1993 so okay well we draw a line underneath it have you drawn a line underneath it no I don't think you have oh jeez no, no. not at all well, where <laughs> I'll go to my grave well, where, 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 <laughs> where will it finish with you when will the line be drawn um, because you're not going to get anything more out of Moriarty, are you? Um, hard to know. You know, I, I've been critical of him. Uh, and I've separate, you've got to separate. He's a chairman of a tribunal, not a high court judge. He's not acting as a high court judge. Yes. So people have been critical of me for supposedly criticising a high court judge. But if you're chairman of a tribunal, uh, you, you you're not a, you're not a member of the judiciary uh, in essence. And I've been very vocal about him. You know, he just. It just ignored everybody, basically. It's unlike the Mahon Tribunal where Frank Dunlop came in and said, here's my books where everybody paid, got money. Nobody has actually said anything about it. Any see, even, even it was true, Dennis. I, it was the sort of... That's what was happening in the 90s. People, I think, wouldn't care to that if you did do it or not, because this was the old hockeyism thing anyway. People were doing it right, left and centre, and it's almost surprising that you didn't do it. Well, I had the money, you know, I, I mean, if you want to, be, let's be realistic here. I wasn't part of the establishment. I didn't have money at the time. And that wasn't the form of business that I was raised on. Like my business, my father set up an international business, but, you know, he never paid people money to buy, you know, you know, commissions to people to yeah. get business or anything. I think it was just straight. The product has its own merits. Okay, we'll draw a line underneath it now. Um... ESAT, uh, you decided after three, four... Did, were you interested in telecommunications, or was this just another no, opportunity? I mean, I met, there was a, the did you know anything about telecommunications? Not a rat. Good God. Um, but I met a guy in the Dublin Horse Show. I was working for my father on a stand, and I met this big American guy uh, called Jack Oaken, and he had set up a telephone company, the first telephone company to compete with AT&T, which was the Monopoly. And he was giving out yards about his phone costs in his hotel, and he said, son, set up a telephone company. And I, that registered, resonated with me. So in 1991, you know, there's going on, Mercury had started in England. I said, hey, this is going to happen here. And the European Union's going to drive it. And that's how we got into business. And so, you know, we were, I was taking money out of the radio station to pay the bills in the telephone company, which is ESAT. And we had no license for three years, and we had a staff of maybe 30 people. And I'd borrowed money in about five banks. And it was a funny money game. You're borrowing to pay interest and capital off some other loan, la, 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 la. I think a lot of people in this room would admit that they've done that. Uh, and uh, But you have to meet your maker. And luckily, we were able to raise about 10 million from a, an American venture capitalist. 
I sold them a third of the business, and out of the ten, they gave me two, and I paid all my debts off. So uh, one Friday night, I went to all the banks, dropped envelopes in, and I said, hip, hip, hooray. And then w- after that, you know, it's very, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this, the first money you raise is the hardest. But then when the numbers get bigger, it's actually easy. You know, uh, you go, we went to the bond market, first of all, raised about $150 million in 1996. And uh, we raised about 50 million of equity from U.S. institutions, and then we went on a tear. We took that money and built fiber optic networks all over <laughs> the country. We built the f- the, f- uh, the mobile phone business. We floated the business at ten dollars a share, and then in 2000 we had a hostile takeover, and we sold it for a hundred dollars a share. Hundred dollars a share, and the hostile the hostile takeover was my by partner was your partner Talon yeah. Or? yeah and they were offering what 72 dollars they were offering 72 and they said you're lucky to get it so I, I there was I what happened I was in New York on a road show going to see investors and the chairman of Telenor r- rang me and said I want to come and see you and I said well I'm in New York we come over to see you so I said jeez I said to my my pal a guy called Paul Connolly who's you know like my Fergal McCork and he said um, he said jeez there's something up so anyway, your man f- comes over on Concord. Now, these fellas wouldn't pay, spend Christmas. So if they're coming on Concord, and I deliberately said I'm free at 12, so just to screw them a little bit. Uh, so they, I said, look, I'm free for an hour during the road show, but I have investor meetings all afternoon. So they arrived into the hotel, New York Palace Hotel, into a meeting room. And they, I, they, there was a coffee pot. And I said, lads, will you have a cup of coffee? And we will have a cup of coffee so he pour on the coffee anyway and then he went for the sugar and the, f- the sugar went everywhere okay so I, I said to myself jeez there's something up here big so he says to me want to buy your company we offer you 72 dollars and I said f off sorry excuse my language I said there's no way I'm going to sell it to you because you have been just so miserable to us they treated us like a Mickey Mouse company even though we were a partner they, I, they, at every chance they tried to screw us and they just never got the mentality of they were a huge big company and I always fear that when you're a big company you treat smaller people badly and they were we were an example of you know that they treated badly and I said I, you're the last person I'm going to sell to you so anyway uh, so they said well you're, you're, you're a public company you only have 14% I said I don't care but I won't be recommending it so we and so the meeting ended very abruptly, and the lads went out the door. Uh, and I rang Dermot Desmond, and he two percent. We'd 49, 49 from Telenor. He two percent. I said, Dermot, there's a problem here. These lads want to have a run at us. So a journalist rang me from Dublin on RT Radio, just out of the blue, and she says, um, I said, and I said, I thought she'd heard the news. And she said, I didn't even know that. So she went on the radio the next morning in Dublin at quarter to eight, and she said, uh, there's a hostile takeover for ESAT, but it's believed the management of the company won't sell it for less than $100 a share. So that hit the expectation up. Now, I got into terrible trouble with the takeover panel. They went apeshit with me. Uh, but I actually got down the knees, and I said, look, I'm inexperienced, you know. <laughs> so... I actually went into this guy, the head of the takeover panel, and I actually threw myself on the floor nearly, okay? Because it was pretty serious stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, and in the end, we went all around Europe. We, we actually rented a plane. I said, there's only one way to get around. We went to see Deutsche Telekom. Um, we went to see every France tele, all the big players, Telefonica, said, will you buy our business because there's a hostile takeover? And eventually, we ended up in London, and I did a deal with the finance director of BT. And we w- w- he had all his advisors in a room, like hundreds of all these fellas, all huge fees and everything. And I, s- I remember Tony Ryan peeling off the head of General Electric to do a deal with him to invest in GPA. I thought it was a brilliant strategy because, you know, when you go into a room, everybody's testosterone. You know, all these investment bankers spoofing. And um, I said, Robert, will we go for a walk? Walk down to the con corridor and I did a deal at $101 a share and then I said we're going to drop the dollar because that's there's a dollar of unknown liability I want to be totally frank with him that he didn't have the full picture on the comp on the balance sheet and I said there's about one dollar of stuff that you know so we'll reduce the price down shook hands 
and we did the deal and then Dermot Desmond had a right to do an offer round on his one his two percent and he flicked it to BT so the game was up wow. so we outmaneuvered Telly Nor and we you know the staff had about three or four hundred dollars worth of shares and I thought it would be a problem facing the staff at about 1500 employees at the time and they said they're all going to kill me for selling the business since changing the whole culture of the business not at all they were all on their PCs working how much they're working on the options <laughs> so we had a huge piss up in the Berkeley court for the staff that night and then it was kind of all over I emptied my office and I went home. I was just newly married, had a child for the first time. But you had a check also in your back pocket? I had a check in my back pocket. How much was the check in the back pocket? About 300. And what? Uh, 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 Dollars. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) and basically, we used to go to a coffee shop every morning at half. I'd get into my suit and go to a coffee shop and read the paper. And then I'd ring my pals. They were all working, so there was nobody available to to doss with. They were all painting buildings, right? Or painting buildings. and that was, I, it was a miserable thing. And I, I think, you know, I'm always warn entrepreneurs when they sell their business, what are they going to do? Will it really make any happiness for them? And, you know, after a month, I would have nearly given the 300 back to get back into the business, been running in the hustle and bustle. Really? Yeah. Did it mean that little to you? Uh, it did, because you kind of hit it. Because you told you know, me at the start that you were yeah. after the money. It's like winning, you know. It's like taking the penalty and win the World Cup. You know, it's, that's it. You know, that day is great. But the next day... This next World Cup. So, right, what was your next World Cup then? Uh, it was down to Jamaica, bought a license on and the how, phone. How long after that? That was about two months. Two months? Two months of coffee. Right. <laughs> and um, I, every, all my pals who were working with me for years building East, that they're saying, BT have taken over, it's shy atmosphere, it's no fun. <laughs> and uh, BT are a great company now, I shouldn't say that. Uh, but, you know, there was, and so they said, can we go? Where, where are we going? So I said, we're going to Jamaica. Why? So I saw an ad in the paper in the FT for a Jamaican mobile phone license. Um, I rang Michael Larry, of course, said, can you get it for me? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I asked a guy, I'd never been to Jamaica, but I asked three questions, how good the competitor was, and apparently they were shocking. Uh, how big is the country, 2.6 million people? How many of them have a mobile? 3%. So we sent a fellow called Franco Carroll down, and he rang me from the auction and was bidding away. And we were in the Morrison Hotel drinking rum, Mount Gay rum, okay? Uh, bidding. And we bid up to 47 and a half sheets, million. And he bought it. And the next morning we woke up, a ferocious hangover. And we said, oh, Christ, what have we done? You know, I've, re- I've emptied my pocket. So we sent people down, about seven people down the following Tuesday. And we got a business going there. We got... Took, overtook the incumbent. We, you know, sold three hundred thousand. It was what, Wireless and cable. cable Wireless, yeah. Cable wireless. They love me, um, and we built a quite a big business in Jamaica. It was profitable. Like within a few months, we invested a hundred million early, you know, in the business, and then all the islands in the Caribbean all deregulated and gave licenses. So, yeah, but this is one of the most unstable regions of the world. Why, why do you still don't dream really? Of I, you see that? all these things about reading World Bank reports and IMF. You don't even read that nonsense. You know what I mean? I wouldn't read that about any country because there's some technocrat has written all this shite and you'd never get out of bed. You know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, there's always, you know, there, if you take mobile phones, there's an opportunity in every country in the world. Okay? It's been proven. So, okay, we were early in the game and uh, we, I, I put the 300 on the horse basically because all the other islands opened up at the same time then we saw the Pacific that was happening we sent another team of Irish managers out there so we had 148 managers sprinkled in 30 countries from El Salvador Panama all around the Caribbean and we put managers in so you know the guy who runs Nauru which is our smallest market makes about a couple of million dollars a year um, he came with a master's from UCD he got a master's better than I was and uh, he runs that business he's only 25 but we've trained him and then he will go to a run to a bigger market that maybe makes 5 or 10 then he'll run to a market that'll make 50 so today we have a turnover of about 2.5 billion and it's all the same process you know we we instantly move we have advertising cut chopped in every market so if our competitor does anything we have a promotion to go into the market and we can predict our revenue within one percent every month and our profits 
So we have a very fine, I've, I've, you know, I've kind of learned the finance along the way. So uh, we have a very strong financial function. Okay, so we've maybe, I don't know, like maybe 300 of him, okay, out of 5,000 people. And we have a very strong, then once a month we meet every market. So the board goes on for two, two and a half days, the board meeting, and every management team comes in and does a presentation on the business, where they're going, you know, six months, a year out, what they're doing to their competitors. And where are you when all these meetings are? I'm sitting there. You are with the rest of my board. Yeah, but you're there at all. That yeah, and I've uh, you know I we, we've uh, sort of run the business as if it's a public company. So we've independent people, independent chair of our audit committee. You know, it's a very hands-on board, but it gives you because the, the 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 complexity of the business and the geographic. You need to meet everybody every month to see where they're going, <laughs> and how you plot your competitor to. Give them the holly. What impact have you had on, on the islands? Because what good a mobile phone to somebody who's living on a dollar a day or two dollars a day? Um, in different degrees. I, I think in Jamaica and Haiti, we've really, we kind of, well, we have a different model. Because of a private company, we have a different, slightly different mo model of, I, I think the model, capitalism model is broken at the moment and for, uh, in a number of facets. But if you make money, like we make a couple hundred million in Jamaica, you have to put a lot of money back in. So we would have an awful lot of projects, particularly education, social projects, special needs that we fund, okay? And we, then you can sleep at night, okay? But I do not want to be seen as a robber baron. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm seen to make a profit, fine, but I, I want to have, a, I want to do something in, you still in have the a moral compass, you still. Absolutely. <laughs> and then in Haiti, you know, we, you know, po before the earth, even before we opened it for business, we got involved with Concern Worldwide and funded some of their projects in Haiti, employing women recycling plastic bottles, for example. But, you know, we we had our foundation set up in Haiti nearly before the business. It's a, it's an important... So when we have a board meeting, we may spend 40% on the foundation in Haiti because there could be something going on. So we built... Um, 20 schools before the earthquake and these would be large scale schools for about 450 children and now we've built another 50 and now we're building another 80 and we go we work with communities because you need community and these could be women who've never been educated but they have this kind of leadership in the community they want the school that's best, best for their children so building the schools was easy in a way but actually training the teachers because none of the teachers have been ever been trained they're accidental teachers really because they've only been trained to about 14 yes. years of age yeah. so we we then feed the children so we're we're in the kind of education business and we've kind of said we're kind of pushing people now to join us because we have 11 contractors and a very good ceo and she's running the whole thing like a machine and you're, you're an, of, an official ambassador for Port-au-Prince, aren't you? I am indeed, yeah. Which is uh, fantastic. That's very nice, yeah. And you and, you and the President Clinton are together We've on, been working on a lot of work out there. You see, a lot of people make promises to poor countries and never meet them. And in the Clinton Global Initiative, he has an awful lot of donors that made promises to Haiti, and his model is different. If you make a uh, promise, you got to keep it. And I do the, the Haitian promises, about $300 million, and I bring them all together, the donors, every six weeks, and we run it like a board meeting. What have you done? You're behind target. You said you'd do this. You said you'd open that clinic. You'd said that, you know, you'd open that school. Where are you? La, 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 la. And it's like running a business, and I do that. So your mother's social conscience has certainly rubbed off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I kind of, it's kind, of, kind of natural. It's not... You know, somebody said you got to do this. It's in a kind of a instinctive, and I think you know everybody, the way they were raised here or in the Republic, everybody gives something into a little box. I remember it was for the leprosy mission or something. You know what I mean? And everybody does something. And we saw this in the Special Olympics, like where everybody just came on board. The whole of Northern Ireland went, we're 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 in. You know what I mean? And you know. 23,000 volunteers, people came out of the woodwork. You came out of the woodwork. Well, I we saw you. I wasn't in the woodwork. No, but you you, you, you were asked to do something. You, I, I remember I saw, that. This is where I saw you working at first hand, and I have to say, and I'll say it now, that mm. the special Olympics.